How many excuses just pop up from almost everywhere all the time? Excuses, excuses, excuses. Well, what are excuses? Why do we get irritated when we hear excuses? Why do people say excuses? Why do folks fall over and give you excuses? What is an excuse? Well, an excuse is a, a justification, an explanation, a defense, a reason, a mitigating circumstance. An excuse is a justification. It's how people make a case for something. An excuse is a rationalization. Uh, sometimes you turn a blind eye to an excuse. An excuse is a failure to do something. My grandmother used to say an excuse is just a plain old lie. When I think of an excuse, I think of someone doubting anxiety, a can't-do spirit, people make an excuse to escape because they may think they may end up failing. If you're hard and really in a difficult situation, you make an excuse. If you don't want to deal with real responsibilities, you give an excuse. If you don't want to face the consequences, you come up with an excuse. Sometimes when we don't want to put on big girl panties and we want to keep wearing those diapers and pampers, we give an excuse. When we underperform and don't do all that we know that we can do, we come up with excuses. When expectations are real big, great expectations, and we feel as if we can't meet those expectations, uh-uh, here comes an excuse. We miss opportunities and doors close in our face when we offer excuses. What could have happened, should have happened, an excuse. When there's insecurity, we give an excuse. And oftentimes, when we're just scared, shaking in our boots, nervous, don't know what to do, afraid, and there's fear, and we're turning yellow, here comes an excuse. I found some quotes that really fall right in line with what we're talking about today. Laura Schlesinger said, people with integrity do what they say they are going to do. Others have excuses. Mahatma Gandhi said, it is wrong and immoral to seek to escape the consequences of one's acts by making excuses. Excuses are for folks who don't want it bad enough. If you don't want something bad enough, you come up with an excuse. Excuses are lies we tell ourselves so if things don't happen to end the way we want them to end, it won't be our fault. So we give an excuse. Excuse, excuse, excuse. Many of the biblical characters that we look up to who are so motivating and inspiring 
and those biblical characters that just give us that extra push when we're trying to figure out what do I need to do? What did this person do when they were in this situation? Think about these folks and think about the excuses that they had for the failures and for the frailties and for the shortcomings and from the boo-boos and from the stuff that they did that were all tied up with excuses. Think about this. Abraham, he was kind of old or he was a seasoned senior citizen. Joseph could have made an excuse and said, my brothers virtually threw me away. Job could have made excuses and said, I lost all of my material wealth. Moses made excuses by saying, by saying I stutter, that's a stutter. Samson could have made excuses because he had a whole bunch of women. Rahab could have made excuses because she had a whole bunch of men. The Samaritan woman made excuses by talking about or not talking about all of the husbands that she had. Noah could have made excuses because he drank a little bit too much. Jacob could have made excuses because he was a swindler and a cheater. David could have made excuses because he loved pretty women and had one of those pretty women's husbands killed. Jonah made lots of excuses and refused to follow God's instructions and ran into a well of a situation. Naomi could have made excuses because she was a widow woman. Peter made a whole bunch of excuses. You know, he was very zealous, but he lied about being connected to Jesus and he denied Jesus three times. Martha, where well, her excuses were tied up with her being finicky and she was a perfectionist and she was a worry ward. Zacchaeus, well, his excuse could have been he was a tiny man and he was hung up on a lot of money. The disciples, you know, they made some real excuses uh, when the soldiers were coming to get Jesus and Jesus told them to stay awake. And what did they do? <sighs> they went to sleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Paul, wow, he could have made a lot of excuses because he was a brilliant intellectual Pharisee, but he persecuted a whole bunch of Christians before he met the man upstairs on the Damascus Road. So many of the people that we look up to, that we say, wow, I want to be like them, we read about, we admire, and we say, that's what we want to be like because they ended up being great biblical characters. Many of them had flaws. Many of them made excuses. Many of them had shortcomings. Many of them had some fallings and some failings in their lives. And who does that sound like? You and you and you and me and all of us. We go through and have gone through the same types of excuses and problems and issues and mess ups and miss ups and mistakes and missteps as Abraham, Joseph, Job, Moses, Samson, Rahab, the Samaritan woman, Noah, Jacob, David, Jonah, Naomi, Peter, Martha, Zacchaeus, the disciples, Paul, 
And it just goes on and on and on and on because we're all human. We're all creatures living here as mere mortals. And we're not part of the divine. We're not like Jesus. We're not like God. We are striving to be righteous. We are striving to get to where Jesus was trying to teach us to become. But until we get there, we are going to be hearing lots of excuses. We are going to be telling lots of excuses. We are going to be hearing lots of excuses because we just haven't got to where we need to be. There are only two options. We need to make progress and grow forward or we need to make excuses. And it's time for us to choose which way we're going to go. Are we going to make progress and go forward and go upward and try to strive toward being even better than what we are right now? Or are we just going to sit here and make excuses and say, well, I'm doing the best I can and shrug our little shoulders and hold our little heads down and have our little pity parties and keep staying right where we are, not moving one inch. It is important. It is just vital for all of us to find a way out of some kind of way and not to keep making excuses. We need to make an effort, not an excuse. We need to make efforts, not excuses. We need to make changes in our lives, not excuses. We need to make choices, not excuses. We need to go forward, not go backwards with excuses. Doug Hall said, don't make excuses. Make things happen. Make changes, then make history. Did you hear that? Don't make excuses. Make things happen. Make changes, then make history. That means all of us can be all that we know we need to be. All of us can listen, actively listen, and hear God tell us the mission that he has given us. Tell us the exact gift, task, assignment that he has given us. And we can go forward and do those assignments and do those tasks and make God happy by fulfilling the wishes and by doing what God has planted within us. We can do that because success will only occur when our dreams end up being much, much, much bigger than our little tiny excuses. We got to make our dreams. We got to make our gifts. We got to make our talents. We got to make our treasures. We got to make whatever God put here in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, we got to make that much bigger than all these little flimsy, crazy excuses that we come up with from day to day. You make them, I make them, we all make them, but we are going to start saying, Lord, we need to make a big, big turn. We need to make a huge transition. We need to make a big, big transformation we need to do a U-turn. We need to spin around and throw down all of those excuses and pick up those dreams and gifts and talents and treasures and ideas and formulas and businesses and books and projects and programs that God has given us, that God has put on our heart, that God has put on our minds, that God has put in our ears, 
that God has put in our dreams when we've been dreaming those real, colorful, technicolor dreams. We need to live those out and make those things become reality. Reality, not nightmares, but realities. And we can do it if we focus, if we plan, if we jot down, if we write out, if we research, if we think, if we study, if we dream big, bold, huge dreams and say, I'm going to keep my eyes up here. Keep your head to the sky. We can do it. The Bible tells us this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest so that you can dream and think and say, God, I'm going to do what you've told me to do. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me and will help me to get where I need to go. And I won't have to depend on making excuses and coming up with fibs and lies and stories and fairy tales and little white lies and y'all know stuff myths that don't even make sense a lot of times, stuff that we just make up because we're scared to go forward, because we're scared to just take that extra step, because we, are, we don't know what's going to happen. We never know what's going to happen, but that's where our faith comes in. Faith over fear, where we know that God will be by our side to help us to make it along the way where we know that God will be our direction, our GPS, our plan. He will show us the way. If we take one step, he'll be right there to give us the next two or three or four steps. Faith over fear. Faith over fear. Faith over fear, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason and the Church of God in Christ. This is my book, and I'm Mabel Springfield Scott, better known on radio as Abel Mabel, your princess of poetry and praise. This book has been quite a journey for me. It really started before I even thought it was a book. It was a dissertation. While I was working on my PhD, at North Carolina A&T State University in Leadership Studies, my professors suggested to me that I focus on a topic that I loved and that I would never, never tire of working on. And I thought about what I've done for most of my life in communications, in working with crisis communications. And so I knew I wanted to write about that and to do research on crisis communications when one of my professors said, why don't you think about a historic figure who has really, really gone through some terrific storms? And the first person that came to mind was Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, the founder of the Church of God in Christ. What I learned in doing my research was that Bishop Mason was a human and he was a man and he was someone who had many, many dreams, but he went through a lot of trials and tribulations and challenges and drama like we experience day to day. And this is what made me realize why when I finished my PhD and finished my dissertation and graduated, I wanted to share what I had learned. This is what this book is all about, a faith that will not shrink. I think that you will enjoy it because it's easy to read and it's easy to follow to see how 
history has changed in America, but yet it hasn't changed because many of the things that happened right after Reconstruction, if you look at America today, you'll see the same things happening and the same problems and issues that he had to deal with, we're dealing with them now. This is why this book is relevant. I encourage you to get this book and to read it and to understand how someone who was born back in the 1800s was able to survive and to lead others to a life of sustainability as he worked with sharecroppers who were coming out of slavery and had absolutely no training, no education, no resources, no money. They had zip. But Bishop Mason knew a God that could make impossibilities become possibilities. And he utilized Bible scriptures and Bible stories throughout the whole Bible. And this is how he taught and helped his sharecropping followers learn how to read, get an education, get great jobs, become entrepreneurs, and become sustainable. And as he and his parishioners thrived and succeeded, that was almost like a magnet to grab and to draw others to find out what are they doing in the Church of God in Christ? What are they doing that has changed these people's lives? What are they doing? I remember when that person, and I remember when that lady, and I remember when that man, but this is what happens when God comes into your life and makes a complete change and a complete transformation. In my research, as we look at crisis management, a crisis can either make you or break you. And what I found so wonderful was how the theories and the principles that we use in crisis management, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason used those same principles and those same theories in order to lead and guide his people as they successfully went through Reconstruction, Jim Crow, Jim Crow Jr., segregation, racism, sexism, bigotry. It's all in this book, Faith Over Fear. Faith over fear, faith over fear. If we can all grasp onto something that's stronger and bigger than you and I, maybe we can make it in the world because we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. And in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And as little kids, we all learn the 23rd of Psalm. But do we really, really let that first verse sink on the inside and encourage us when we're not feeling the way we want to feel? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You don't have to want for anything. All you have to do is put your life in the hands of the man who calmed the waters and calmed the seas. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Stop the fearing. Stop the fretting. Stop the anxiety. Stop getting upset. Stop getting extra gray hair, extra wrinkles. You can make it, but you need something stronger and bigger than you and I. Faith over fear, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason and the Church of God in Christ. How can an humble, unassuming loner survive sickness, death, depression, suicidal tendencies, and isolation. Born to ex-slaves after the Emancipation Proclamation in the segregated rural South, Charles Harrison Mason's lifeline was God and the Holy Bible. His mother's slave religion preserved him through crisis, hardships, persecutions, and pain. Bishop Charles Harrison Mason advocated Pentecostal holiness, prayer, fasting, Afrocentric music, ring dance, call response, and the African drum beat of the motherland. When Jim Crow divided the races worshiping with God, Bishop Mason was joining together a diversity of believers like the New Testament church. As the government officials, law enforcement, and the FBI tried to tangle with Mason 
God protected him like Daniel, Jonah, Peter, Paul, and Silas. His trials became triumphs as his faith navigated him through unbearable storms. Modeling biblical heroes molded Mason and his followers into strong disciples with scriptural principles and disciplined lifestyles. Long hours of study, meditating, prayer, fasting, and digesting the exact word of God made Bishop Mason an exceptional preacher, faithful, anointed, discerning, humble, selfless, focused, wise, courageous, long-suffering, and resilient. Mason's legacy illustrates the true strength of God's ability to use ordinary people to become extraordinary people. One last thing that really let me know that God was leading and guiding and serving as my GPS as I wrote this book, Faith Over Fear, was when we did the official book signing at the Barnes & Noble bookstore, which is located in Friendly Shopping Center in a very upscale neighborhood in Greensboro, North Carolina. A number of my friends and colleagues and past bosses came to the book signing and I did a question and answer. During the question and answer, a lady gave her life to the Lord. And at first it kind of threw me because I was thinking, well, nobody was singing and nobody was preaching. All I was doing was just talking about the book, Faith Over Fear and Bishop Charles Harrison Mason. But it let me know that God was saying, you've done a good job, job well done. And it let all of us realize that there are so many things that we can do in our normal, regular, everyday living to touch people's lives and let them know that there is hope. All they need is faith over fear. That lady coming to Christ in a Barnes and Noble bookstore, it blew my mind. Faith over fear, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason and the Church of God in Christ. This is Mabel Springfield Scott inviting you to read Faith Over Fear, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason and the Church of God in Christ. I guarantee you, it'll really increase your confidence and your faith to overcome. Mm -hmm.